He was a beloved international celebrity who made headlines in the 80s for his jet-setting playboy lifestyle. Sensing that his nation was being held back from its great potential, he left behind the comforts and glamour of his previous life to endure the slings and arrows of the political arena. As destiny would have it, in the mid-2010s, he made both headlines and history by defeating two powerful, corrupt political family dynasties with a populist campaign that galvanized his fellow citizens and catapulted him into the highest office in the nation. Despite, or perhaps because of his many accomplishments in office, the corrupt national security establishment did everything in its power to undermine him and ultimately remove him from office. Now that he seeks office once again, the national security state has pulled out all of the stops to stop him, including countless phony indictments related to mishandling of classified material, inciting riots, and more. Despite what my American listeners might think, I'm not talking here about President Donald Trump, but another larger-than-life populist leader, the great Imran Khan former Prime Minister of the Islamic Republic of Pakistan and current leader of the PTI party. The embattled Khan joins us from his home in Lahore, Pakistan, where he's currently confined to house arrest. Mr. Prime Minister, greetings from Miami, Florida. It is an absolute honor to be speaking with you. My pleasure, Darren. Look forward. No, this we have a lot of interesting material to cover. And of course, we want to hear about your condition and the persecution of you and your supporters in particular, and obviously more about the plot to remove you from power by the Pakistani deep state and maybe even elements of the U.S. government. But before all of that, I'd like to take us back to the journey leading to July 26, 2018 the date you were elected prime minister. Now, as I alluded to, you defeated two entrenched political dynasties and families, Bhutto and Sharif, in your electoral victory. Can you please explain to the audience what it meant for someone not from these families or from the military to rule Pakistan? What was the agenda you ran on and what are your proudest accomplishments in office? Well, Darren, uh, I formed my movement for justice. That was my party 27 years ago. And reason I, uh, I, I called it movement for justice is because, you know, being a student of politics, political history, and especially my, um, my getting exposure as a teenager to, uh, to, to England, where I went to study, and as well as I used to play professional sport, uh, I found out that the only difference between prosperous countries and poor countries is rule of law. Countries that have a just system, where there is uh, where the weak are protected from the strong by the constitution and the, and the judiciary, and where the powerful are brought under the rule of law, they prosper. Those countries forge ahead of uh, other countries, which despite all the resources, remain poor because they do not have rule of law. So hence, I call my party Movement for Justice. But when you try and bring the powerful under the control, bringing them under the law, that means you're taking on powerful mafias who are benefiting from a corrupt system. So, uh, you know, so when you, you know, they are not going to give up control easily because they are beneficiaries and they're from power and power brings in money and they're above law. They can break the law and get away with it. So this is not just the problem, uh, Darren, with Pakistan. Basically, it is the problem with the entire developing world. The poor countries are poor because they do not have, they cannot bring the powerful elites under the law. And so the, so the elites of the poor countries siphon off, plunder the country, take their wealth and, and, and take them to offshore accounts and Western capitals. So basically, the poor countries are being plundered by their ruling elites because they're above law. 
So this was my struggle, and I was always going to come up against those, those powerful elites who did not want to be brought under the law. And that's what I am facing right now. Indeed, indeed. And unfortunately, I'd have to say it's not only an issue with developing countries. We certainly have our own issues with, uh, with deep corruption in the United States as well, which maybe we could get into later. And before we move on, I'm just curious, what, what are some of the your proudest accomplishments while in office, some of the struggles that you had um, economically and maybe some of the progress you made in combating this deeply entrenched corruption that you speak of? Well, first, let me tell you where I failed. I failed to bring the powerful under the law because unfortunately, you know, while I had the responsibility, the actual veto power belonged to the army chief. And he was not interested in, uh, in accountability of the powerful. So uh, because he was not interested, um, you know, I, I'm afraid I failed there because I had a weak government. In other words, in a parliamentary democracy, if you have a coalition government with a very thin majority, then it is very difficult to make powerful decisions because, uh, you know, you, you can always be destabilized. And in the end, we were destabilized by, uh, by the powerful. You know, they, they destabilized my government. And, and so uh, I was removed. Uh, so um, what, but that is where I failed. I mean, I'm saying I failed in bringing rule of law because I just did not have uh, a strong enough government in a parliamentary democracy. But what was, where did I, I guess my biggest achievement was uh, dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic. Mm -hmm. Remember, it ravaged most of the world and it, it ravaged two of our neighbors. I mean, India suffered massively from, uh, from, from COVID-19 and so did Iran on the other side, uh, on, on, the, on the east and west. But Pakistan was one of the three top countries in the world which handled the pandemic the best. We saved our people from the, uh, from the uh, devastating impact on our hospitals. Remember, the hospitals were overrun. In Pakistan, mm -hmm. our hospitals were never overrun the way we dealt with it. But we also saved our economy. I mean, we were the ones to recover the fastest uh, from, the, uh, fr from the impact of, uh, on the economy of the pandemic. And also, we saved our poor people because pandemic really caused a lot of poverty. Because when you, uh, when you lock down, basically people go out of work. And in Pakistan, we had, uh, you know, uh, uh, informal labor, not registered. We had weekly, daily wages. So the moment you lock down, I mean, these people, you know, who need to make money to feed their families, where were they going to go? So we we right. dealt with it probably one of the countries that dealt with it with it the best, and then also we inherited a bankrupt economy, and our last two years were considered that one of the best uh, uh, performing economies in, in Pakistan in in seventeen years. So we mm. from a bankrupt ec account, uh, economy we actually performed the best, and actually recently endorsed by the in few days back. The IMF endorsed the, the, the way we, uh, we lifted our economy from, uh, from a, a, a bankrupted one. Yes, no, that's a great accomplishment. And you know, what you were saying earlier about corruption, it reminds me, I think, on another occasion, you pointed out that it's critical for a leader who has responsibility to also wield authority. And you can speak to your own case, but from what I've seen in other countries, including the case of the United States, when a leader is extremely popular, has the profound support of the people, it's very unfortunate when the institutions and the bureaucracies don't cooperate because that creates a condition where the elected leader with the support and love of the people does not have the authority to do what the people elected him to do. And one kind of pithy saying I picked up from a book of yours is that it's impossible to rule Pakistan without these three A's, Allah, Army, and America. 
And we'll leave aside two A's for the moment and just talk about one of these institutions, which is the Army and the intelligence services that you mentioned. My understanding is in the beginning, you had a fairly good relationship with these institutions, or at least not an acrimonious one. At some point, though, the relationship turned, leading to your um, ouster effectively. Could you explain a little bit, in your view, what soured between you and at least certain elements within the Army and intelligence services in Pakistan? Well, uh, uh, Darren, just before I wanted to mention two other things which I was quite proud of. One was we started uh, a huge environmental campaign of replanting trees in Pakistan. We called it mm. the 10 billion tree tsunami. And so that was acknowledged internationally that you know it was one of the best initiatives to fight climate change. And Pakistan is quite vulnerable there. We are in the top 10 countries which are most likely to be affected by, by climate change. And secondly, we, what I was quite proud of, we actually um, had uh, one of the best programs, again in, acknowledged internationally, for uplifting people out of poverty, and that was called our ESAS program. And that too was acknowledged by everyone, you know, where we, um, we tried to uh, give a cushion to the, the most vulnerable part of our population. And uh, my idea was basically to move on to make Pakistan a welfare state, and we provided health insurance. Now, for every family in Pakistan, we provided them 1 million rupees uh, so that they could go to any hospital to get uh, treated. So this is for a country where you have large number of poor people or vulnerable people, which in case of Pakistan is almost 100 million, then this is the biggest gift, a blessing that you can give people health cover. Bearing in mind that we still much richer countries like than us have did not come up with a program like our health insurance. Now coming down to uh, the question you've asked me. Look, in Pakistan, for 70 years, the army has basically been uh, either directly ruling us through martial laws or indirectly, basically because they've been entrenched. And, you know, to be fair, the army has been hugely popular in Pakistan because, you know, we we started off as a, a independence in 47. But 1948 was our first conflict with India. And India being seven times the size of Pakistan, there became a lot of, we grew up with insecurity that would we survive as a nation? So the over-dependence on the army. And army was, was popular in Pakistan. And, uh, you know, even martial laws when they were imposed, sometimes were greeted with, uh, you know, people celebrated a martial law. But gradually over a period of time, and specifically in the last 20 years, the realization came in this country, and you know, as your thought process evolves through your past experiences, uh, the the idea that you know, yes, martial law, you know, we used to welcome them, but it was like dealing with cancer with discipline, because for a while it seemed good, but after a while, you know, the the country would always go on the wrong track, because basically martial law is not the answer to a problem, the answer to a problem is genuine democracy, is rule of law. Countries that prosper always prosper because they have rule of law, genuine democracy, uh, a, a government that represents people and is accountable to the people, and, 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 and above all, you know, human rights, uh, a, a government that protects the rights, fundamental rights of its people, in fact, liberates them, or it liberates the potential of a people. So therefore, this is the realization that came in, especially in the last 20 years. Our media got free. We had one of the freest medias, vibrant media. And then in 2007, what was called the lawyers movement, our judiciary became basically uh, started asserting its independence. So before that, the judiciary was considered a part of the executive. So the, the, the separation of power, the check and balance, on the executives began to, uh, you know, for the first time you started experiencing, but right now all that has been rolled back. Uh, so reason is that the, uh, the status quo, people who, are, who have, had, have been above law, they are the ones who are now asserting themselves and want, you know, are fighting. So we are, 
Right now, there's a conflict between two systems. Do we go back to the old system where a small clique, uh, what we call elite capture, they are basically in control of the resources and, and they're above law? Or do we want to now move, which is the movement which is I'm leading it right now, and I have to say that never have so many people now supported a party, uh, the agenda of rule of law and, and genuine freedom, which is what genuine democracy is. So we are now on, on a crossroads in our country. Uh, so this is where we are right now. And you know, this is where you see me um, as, um, in, in my current position with 180 cases. Uh, charges against me and uh, the chance that could be sent to jail anytime. Yes, and we'll definitely talk more about those conditions. So is, is there anything from your point of view that you did in particular that soured the relationship with these institutions or are you suggesting it's more of a kind of systemic thing or can you think about, you know, certain policies that you suggested or internal disputes that might account for pretty seemingly dramatic um, souring of the relationship between you and at least certain officials in the Army and intelligence services? Well, you know, Darren, when you speak about the Army, Army basically means one man, the Army chief. And he yeah. is powerful. And he... So a lot depends on him, his personality, you know, his, his vision. So if, uh, you know, once the, I mean, over, over the years, the position of the army chief, uh, chief has accumulated a lot of power. Mm -hmm. And if somehow he decided that he, for some reason, did not like me as the prime minister, then he has a lot of levers to make sure that I can, you know, ensure that I can be removed. And so, and that's what happened. Now, I tried my best to work with him, knowing that you know, uh, you know, for the for Pakistan's economic well-being, because we were, as I said earlier, we were in an economic mess. Country was basically bankrupt. We had the biggest current account deficit in our history, which means external deficit. So, therefore, you know, you needed all the resources in the countries to fight this challenge. And so for a while it worked because, you know, the most organized institution is the army. And so I worked with the army chief pretty well. But, but I all, always had this problem, whereas I wanted the powerful mafias, political mafias under the rule of law. And he didn't. I mean, for him, corruption was no big deal. And he was constantly in touch with them. And in the end, he scuttled all moves to... Uh, to bring them under the law. Uh, but more importantly, at what, some point he decided that I had to be removed. Now he is the best person to answer that. There are various theories. The strongest theory is that the current prime minister who was then in the opposition, he offered him an extension. And mm -hmm. that's what really was the reason uh, that he conspired to actually have me removed. Now, bear in mind again that the country at that time was, the economy was performing better than it had in the last 17 years. You know, it wasn't perfect, but it was going in the right direction. So that's when he pulled the rug under the feet. Yes, yes, this individual, um, this General Bajwa, I believe in a stream yesterday, you provided some pretty comprehensive details on Bajwa's machinations against you. Um, how did he plot against you uh, exactly? Could you tell the people just some of the things, you know, what your view is of the plot and his specific role in it? There's talk about him, you know, plotting some early on months in advance of your ultimate ouster and, um, you know, traveling to the United States or using the United States in some fashion. You could Expound a little bit on that. Well, you know, in, in brief, look, countries look after their own interests. You know, you know, we, we are naive when we are younger. We talk about countries, certain countries, a friend of country. Yes, uh, you know, there's a lot of affiliation between sometimes between two countries, the people of the two countries. 
But eventually, countries make decisions on what is their interest. Mm -hmm. So, in a nutshell, what General Bajwa uh, did by hiring this uh, this lobbyist, uh, you know, in, in the United States, and no, me not knowing that he had hired him. I mean, it's only afterwards, after my government was removed, that we discovered that uh, you know he had been formally hired by Pakistan to to lobby for Pakistan. And he basically, the whole idea was to convince the Americans that I was anti-American. So I was against their interest. So that, that's what happened. And, uh, you know, he, they, they apparently thought that I, you know, the reason I went to Russia was on, was because I had decided, not because it was an inst uh, all the stakeholders the foreign office, everyone was on board to take a decision that I, we should improve our relationship with Russia for, for various reasons. We had a pipeline, North-South pipeline, which, you know, the Russian company was, were most qualified to make in Pakistan. Then we wanted to um, try to get a concession on oil from importing oil from Russia, as India did. And then we needed 2 million tons of wheat from Russians. So that's how the trip was planned. But it was, that's not how it was presented to the US. It was because uh, in the communique, which this American official did with our, with, with our uh, ambassador in Washington, was that I had chosen on myself, by myself to go to the US, which was patently right. wrong. So clearly there was a plan to uh, discredit me, and this plan started a few months back, since this uh, official was hired, six months back at least, and he, he and he had also had an agreement with the current prime minister that uh, you know uh, uh, that that uh, uh, he would probably get an extension. So now, I mean, the some of the ministers sitting in the government are say, are openly saying that. General Bajwa had decided to get rid of me even earlier than that, even uh, earlier than six months. And, and so that's what happened. Yes, now that's very interesting. And, you know, there are even rumors, maybe you can address this, that Bajwa himself was encouraging this very visit to Russia that you speak about that's become the subject of such controversy. Is that accurate? Well, uh, you know, when the, the plans formed to go to Russia were being made, not only uh, did I consult all retired foreign secretaries, I had a meeting with all of them. And all of them said for the future of Pakistan, because of the things I've said, oil, pipeline, uh, wheat, we needed to improve our relationship with them. Mm -hmm. So it was all the foreign secretaries, the foreign office was on board. And then the, the military needed some hardware from Russia. So that was another reason. Uh, but, you know, just before leaving, um, when I was supposed to leave for Russia, the evening before there was some movement, uh, you know, in um, uh, Russian troops and I think Donbass or something like that. And I, I called up uh, the army chief, General Bajwa, in the morning before leaving. I said, should I go? Because, you know, there's tensions seem to have increased. The invasion took place when I was actually there the next day. So he said, oh, we've made consultation uh, with my other uh, colleagues, and I think you should go. So that's how I went. Right. Right. And by the way, just, you know, my own view on this, I think a lot of people think this, it's not a criminal thing to visit Russia. That's what leaders do, is they visit other countries and they make agreements and mutual uh, of mutual benefit, and you know, correct me if I'm wrong, but a simple visit for um, the various agreements that was scheduled before this invasion even took place, that's not necessarily a sign that you're supporting the invasion. Well, you know, Darren, when you have state visits, they are planned months ahead because there's a lot of preliminary work that needs to be done before actually the head of state visits another country. Right. So uh, it, clearly it wasn't a spontaneous move, which is what it appeared right. from the con the uh, the conversation between our ambassador and the American official. 
Um, right. And it appeared that I had taken this decision on my own. And secondly, the timing was bad. I wasn't right. supposed to know that, you know, hours before my meeting with President Putin, Russia would invade uh, Ukraine. How was I supposed to know? Right. It was bad timing. And I guess, you know, once a war starts and people take sides, then there is a, you know, then there was a a feeling that, you know, how why, how could uh, Pakistan Prime Minister be there at the time? But, you know, as I said, it wasn't planned. I mean, I wasn't supposed to know what, you know, the timing of the war. Right, right. Putin didn't text you beforehand telling you that there's going to be an invasion the next day, I'm assuming. Had he, so. had he, had he asked my advice, I can tell you, Darren, I'm a... I'm someone who does not believe in wars sol uh, solving problems. I'm not one of those who believes. I mean, I have always advised, uh, you know, there were the heads of states in the Middle East who I met. And I was mm -hmm. I tried my best to sort of reduce tensions uh, between our neighbors and, uh, you know, friendly states. Uh, you know, Turkey had problems with some Middle Eastern states. So I tried my best. And I, I'm a firm believer. That you know you can start a conflict, but you can you do not have control how long it takes. And I'm a, a student of history, so I we have seen my country getting into conflicts, even internal conflicts, when we've used military solutions um, with our own people. It's always been a disaster. You go to solve yeah. one problem, you create a host of other problems uh, when you use military. So you know here's someone who who. Who, who always uh, has been against military solutions. Right. Right. Now, that's, uh, I think we can all agree it's better to find other options if if possible. Um, so now, you know, we got to move on to what I would say overwhelmingly most people are interested in or at least express to me, which is perhaps the most controversial and explosive aspect of the plot against you, which is, of course, the alleged role of at least some elements of the U.S. government and the Biden administration. And just for a little bit of context, why it's important to Americans is that domestically, we've constantly vilified other nations, in particular Russia, actually, for allegedly meddling in our elections, even though there hasn't been a tremendous amount of evidence. But there's it's a football thrown around, a weapon thrown around in our domestic discourse of accusing other countries of meddling in our elections. And so the prospect that um, there was a diplomatic cipher from an American State Department official Effectively, correct me if I'm wrong about this cipher, but what, from, I'm, from what I've heard from other interviews, it was basically saying um, to your ambassador, saying, look, uh, if you guys don't do a no confidence vote and effectively take Prime Minister Khan out of power, there will be consequences for Pakistan, which, if true, is a pretty egregious case of meddling on the part of Biden administration officials. So I was wondering if you could address that as to its accuracy or maybe provide more, more details or context so we can understand what the deal is with this so-called cipher. Well, look, Darren, let me first say something that, look, uh, U.S is Pakistan's uh, biggest trading partner. Uh, you know, Pakistan exports more to the U.S. than any other country. And secondly, one of the most powerful expatriate Pakistan communities is uh, the Pakistani-American uh, community. You know, they are one of the most powerful, uh, influential communities uh, of Pakistanis living abroad. So Pakistan should always have good relationship with the United States. And let me say I had excellent relationship with the Trump administration. Why, you know, uh, for some reason, I, you know, I, I did not have much contact with the uh, Biden administration, you know, when uh, Joe Biden came to power. And so 
the what is the lead up to what is the the whole cipher controversy uh my feeling is that the us was made to realize once the army chief had decided that i had to go uh and when he hired this lobbyist uh and under my government and me not knowing that he had hired this lobbyist uh so i think they made the biden administration feel that imran khan was anti american mm. now i think that's why that is the reason why the cipher originated uh from uh, from washington this this conversation uh, an official conversation between uh the uh, uh under secretary of state and pakistani uh, ambassador asad majid mm-hmm. and so when i when i received the cipher i have to say i was uh, you know shocked right. i mean you not get a prime minister does not get a communique from his ambassador saying that the the uh, the official from this other country is telling the ambassador that unless they get rid of the prime minister there would be consequences of pakistan so i mean who would not be shocked right. i mean but then when i i wondered that how could he be the ambassador couldn't get rid of me so, uh, uh, the foreign office can't get rid of the prime minister so who was this meant for and it was clear it was meant for general bajwa the cipher was meant for him that you know it was i i should be got on rid of in a vote of no confidence and the next day the vote of no confidence was tabled in the uh, national assembly and right. you know then we literally the next day gone. right exactly the next day and within weeks that's, the government was gone that's amazing so just for people listening just to make sure that the point drives home there is a cipher a letter from us diplomatic officials saying have a vote of no confidence to get rid of prime minister khan basically overthrow the government or there will be consequences and literally the next day is when this vote was proposed it's look it's uh, cipher means you know just for the audience cipher is um is a is a secret codified message given by the ambassador uh, to the foreign office so uh, it is a conversation official conversation which is recorded and then that conversation is sent through this coded message which is called a cipher it is to the to the foreign office and of course it reaches the prime minister so the wiki leaks what was wiki leaks it was the this communication uh, became um uh, exposed and that's what the leak was about the conversation between the us ambassadors uh and and what they were sending to the state department so that's what yeah. called the cipher so yeah, absolutely so yes exactly i mean this conversation was reported to me through the cipher and uh, and yes that's what it said uh so mr prime minister i know we're kind of pressed for time so i want to make sure i get the most important questions and material out there and just to say it just as an american i'll say it's it's seems to me like glaring hypocrisy on the part of the Biden administration that's constantly complaining about alleged meddling from other countries to take the step of issuing a cipher that's basically giving an ultimatum get rid of this democratically elected leader or there will be consequences now um you know i have to get into something that could be interesting could be controversial but the the public really wants to know your position on it um i know that there's this individual called donald lu who is one of the people associated with this cipher the diplomatic official given his ranking um as the, the under secretary i believe or assistant secretary for central asian south asian affairs the reality is is that someone like donald lu would only be a messenger boy he's not devising this policy in his own right and many people have perhaps logically speculated that a woman named victoria newland who is lu's boss might have a more active 
role in this. And Victoria Newland is a pretty notorious operative in terms of regime change. And experts agree, for instance, that she was instrumental in the Maidan revolt in Ukraine. And just to make matters more interesting, which you probably know already, but you've been a very vocal critic of America's disastrous war on terror, not just under Bush, but the drone strike policy under Obama. Now, if I could give the audience one guess as to who the State Department spokeswoman was defending Obama's drone strike policies, it was none other than Victoria Newland. So are you familiar with this possibility? Does the name strike a bell? Do you think that your opposition to the war on terror and the war in Iraq, Victoria Newland's husband is one of the intellectual architects of the war in Iraq, of which you've been a vocal critic. Do you think this specific element of the American security state might bear some additional responsibility for what's happened to you? Well, you know, uh, Darren, I'm, I, I don't know the Americans, uh, you know, uh, the officials. I mean, I basically know what I what I've just told you about the cipher and uh, and you know a conversation between Donald Liu and uh, our ambassador. How far it went up, I have no idea. I mean, um, who else was involved? I don't know. Uh, so I can't really comment on 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 the names of Victoria and other people who you've mentioned. But about war on terror, I can just the reason I, I mean I'm simple. Why was I a critic of that? There are two areas which concerned us. Uh, one was the war on terror in Pakistan, you know, with the drone strikes and and sort of the drone strikes in our on our side of the border of Afghanistan. And, and then the other one was Afghan, um, the whole uh, uh, Afghan um, uh, uh, adventure, which I never quite understood. What were the aims? I mean, what did the U.S. Uh, what did they want to achieve from uh, uh, invasion of Afghanistan? And especially once Osama bin Laden was killed, then what was the uh, what was the reason of staying in the in Afghanistan? Because you know these ideas of bringing democracy or liberating the Afghan women. I mean, these you know it, there was no clear. I never understood what was going to be victory in the U.S. in Afghanistan, but in Pakistan it it created havoc. You know, there were over 400 drone strikes in Pakistan. And it's the only time an ally is bombed, you know, uh, 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 by another country. I mean, we were an ally of the U.S. in the war on terror. There were over 400 drone strikes. And I kept opposing it because it was senseless. All it was doing, doing was it was cre creating more militants because collateral damage was the reason why the, Talib, the Taliban in Afghanistan, their numbers increased. And collateral dam damage was the reason why the TTP, the Pakistani Taliban kept, uh, the, the militants kept growing. So it actually exacerbated the situation. It didn't solve anything. It just created hatred. And anyone who had relatives lost in a drone attack would go and join the militants. Because that whole area, the border area of uh, Pakistan and Afghanistan, what was called our tribal areas. I mean, when you had a drone attack in a village, clearly, it, you know, in trying to kill one or two militants, it also killed a lot of innocent people. So they, in trying to avenge the, the, the deaths, they would then become part of the militants and take revenge against Pakistan security forces. So we lost 80,000 people in that war on terror. I mean, which ally of the U.S. would have paid such a heavy cost for becoming an ally? 80,000 Pakistanis died, over a hundred billion dollars lost to the economy. So I opposed simply for that reason, because, you know, my, I mean, I'm a Pakistani and my first thing should be to preserve Pakistani lives and Pakistani property and damage to this country. And we, we were the collateral damage of the Afghan war. Right. No, I think it's it's a tragedy not only for 
Pakistan there, it's also a tragedy because it wasn't even in America's interest. And I think most American people realize that now in the aftermath of just what a disaster and costly disaster in terms of money and lives the Afghanistan war was and hope Americans learn from this. And I think they have. I know I know you're pressed for time. I know your folks are saying you got to go. So uh, before, I'd just like to say, first of all, I'd like to thank the, the great um, a founding member of the PTI, Mr. Jahangir and Ramsha Afridi for making this discussion possible. I'd like to thank you, um, your, you know, remarkable courage. It's, you know, it's, I know your position is in Pakistan, but your courage and the fact that you are all in, you're putting it all on the line for your vision, for your cause, for your country, for your people. And that's inspiring to everybody that sees it. And I know that you have a lot of love and support from America and from Americans, despite whatever may have happened with a certain segment of corrupt and really criminal elements of the American national security community. So I know you have to go. So I'd just like to thank you and say it's been an honor and we're praying for you in America and hope everything resolves well for you and for your country. Thank you, Darren. It was a pleasure talking to you. Thank you. Thank you.